Welcome everybody and welcome back to Vaccine Day. It's wonderful to be able to be here in BD with a, with a group of you and of our faculty, our staff, our students, and to be with a larger community online. Um, we're recording this Vaccine Day symposium so that we can share it uh, later on with a wider community. This is our 12th vaccine day, and I wanted to say our 12th annual, but it's not quite that because we had to skip the event in 2020. And as you can see, we've had a very distinguished group of keynote speakers since the very beginning. And this year's speaker and Dean's Medal recipient, Dr. Barney Graham, continues in this very great tradition. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Dean McKenzie about Dr. Graham's many accomplishments and attributes. I first, though, like to tell you actually what a personal thrill it is for me to have Barney here with us today and to be able to honor him in this way. Barney and I have been close colleagues for decades through our work on respiratory syncytial virus and more recently through our work together on WHO committees. And at all of these meetings in his very quiet and very gentle way, Barney always manages to say, the right thing at exactly the right time. And often there's this little moment of silence as people contemplate the profundity of what he's just said. So needless to say, and as he very well knows, I've always looked up to Barney. <laughs> <laughs> one, one final word about Barney as a role model for our faculty and especially for our students. As many of you know, um, Barney recently retired from his position as deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center, the VRC, at the NIH. And uh, on the occasion of his retirement, and I put that in quotes because as you'll hear, he's only doing something different. He's not really fully retired. But in any event, his colleagues at the VRC were asked to provide one word that best describes him. And this word cloud is the result. So, while we all know that Barney is a big, brilliant fashionista, it's really telling that kind is the first word that comes to mind to describe this remarkable scientist. So thank you, Barney, for all that you have done and continue to do to make our world a better place. Dean McKenzie will tell you a bit more about Dr. Barney Graham's life and his accomplishments and will award the school dean's medal. Dr. McKenzie. Well, thanks, Ruth, and it's a, a delight to be here. It's a delight to see real people uh, coming together. Um, you know, one of the benefits of, of the pandemic, we always say, is that we um, are able to get even a larger audience uh, uh, through our live streaming. And I know there are many, many people um, who are joining us today. Uh, we just can't see them, but uh, uh, it's a thrill uh, to have so many of you uh, join us. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, next year's Vaccine Day will um, be in person even more so. But it's great to see everybody. And I think it's, it's fair to say that um, we would not be here, even in our small uh, gathering here today, if it weren't for vital public health measures and the rapid development of COVID-19 uh, vaccines. The progress that was made in less than two years is truly remarkable. Although the biology and the vaccine design behind this science uh, began many, many years ago, as we'll hear about today. I am thrilled um, to um, have this opportunity today uh, to introduce you to one of the architects of vaccine research, Dr. Barney Graham. So first, a little bit about um, his earlier years. I won't go too far back, but um, he was born and raised in Kansas, and Dr. Graham grew up on a family farm which uh, he helped to operate for um, several years. He credits the experience um, on the farm with giving him a knack for fixing things as well as foundational skills in problem solving. He went to Houston to complete his undergraduate uh, ed education at Rice University and earned his medical degree at the University of Kansas. Then at Vanderbilt University, he completed his residency an Infectious Disease Fellowship, and received a PhD in Microbiology and Immunology. He remained there on the faculty before going to the NIH Vaccine Center, 
in 2000, where he was uh, originally recruited to conduct vaccine uh, trials. There, he rose to the position of deputy director and chief of the viral pathogenesis uh, laboratory. He is married to Dr. Cynthia Turner Graham, a medical school classmate and a psychiatrist who's still practicing, and is the father to three children, and I'm very jealous he has eight grandchildren, <laughs> to my only two. But uh, <laughs> I should note that Dr. Graham uh, would have been a wonderful candidate for the Dean's Medal even before uh, we were uh, hit with a pandemic. He's an accomplished HIV clinical and laboratory investigator who contributed to the development of broadly neutralizing HIV antibodies. He's also made key contributions to our understanding of the pathogenesis of enhanced respiratory syncytial sens uh, uh, virus disease, or RSV, uh, filling a knowledge gap that has delayed um, uh, vaccine development in this particular area for decades. Probably his most uh, remarkable contributions, though, have been in applying structural biology to vaccine development. This strategy determines the molecular structure of viral proteins most likely to elicit a protective immune response and then to design vaccines that express these proteins in the right way. This precision vaccinology approach is a true paradigm shift and has led Dr. Graham and his team to design vaccines um, or monoclonal antibodies for RSV, uh, Zika, Ebola, Nipah, as well as MERS. And of course, there's SARS-CoV-2. Dr. Graham, along with Dr. Kizmikia Corbett and Jason McClellan and their teams, determined the optimal structure of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein and co-developed Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. And now more than 165 million doses have been distributed in the United States alone. The information they generated has also been used to design other COVID-19 vaccines and monoclonal um, antibodies. In addition to being a remarkable scientist in his own right, Dr. Graham is an extraordinary mentor. He has trained and collaborated with young investigators who have themselves risen to prominence. He is profoundly committed to diversity and equity, including global equity for vaccine manufacturer distribution, which we understand will be his next area of focus in his, quote, retirement. I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Graham this morning. Doesn't sound like he's retiring to me. He's got a lot, um, lot of things um, that he is um, so very much committed to doing, uh, which was so exciting to hear about, and we will hear about this morning. So Dr. Graham, it is my honor to bestow upon you the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Dean's Medal. It is the highest recognition of the school uh, that we confer on public health researchers and practitioners who demonstrate exceptional leadership in their fields in safeguarding and improving the public's health. You are a pioneer whose commitment to scientific discovery and life-saving vaccine research has truly transformed our world. Thank you. Your inspiring work uh, is, was so needed at the right time, and we um, appreciate all you have done. So if you would please uh, join me in front of the uh, podium. And I will bestow upon you, hopefully, <laughs> 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 And now it is my pleasure um, to ask uh, Dr. Graham to give the keynote address um, for this Vaccine Day uh, Symposium. Please welcome Dr. Barney Graham. Well, uh, thank you for um, Dean McKenzie. That, um, I'm a little bit speechless humbled by that, but um, we're going to move on. And how do I get to the slides? Having this honor from Johns Hopkins, too, as uh, you 
know, it's the epitome of academic medical centers. And so have, being recognized this way from Johns Hopkins is, is a special honor. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the historical things that happened these last couple of years and explain why we were able to go as fast as, as we did and, and talk a little bit about how I hope that it can influence uh, vaccinology going forward. First, um, I'm an inventor on vaccine and monoclonal antibody patents for several virus diseases. And I am the former deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center at NIH. And I'm not there anymore, but it's still sort of part of who I am. And I'm, I want to tell you about the place briefly before we get started, because uh, it is a special place. And it was founded and started around 2000 to develop an HIV vaccine. And even though that has not yet happened, the technology that's been generated to work on an HIV vaccine has really been the driving force behind uh, vaccine concepts and antibodies for a number of other unmet needs, including uh, emerging infectious diseases. I can find the cursor. There it is. And that's been possible because the VRC is not only this basic research building, Building 40 on the Bethesda campus, but it's also about 100 engineers in Gaithersburg doing process development, another 100 or so doing GMP manufacturing on a pilot scale, a self-standing clinic, and a lab that focuses on laboratory analysis of our clinical samples. So it's almost uh, 600 people now. It's like a small vaccine biotech company, and it's run by this relatively small group of principal investigators led by John Moscola, pictured here. And over the years, we've had the opportunity to work on a number of different vaccine modalities. I'll talk some about mRNA today, but we've also worked on vaccine vectors, uh, virus-like particles, as we did for chikungunya, protein-based or nanoparticle display-based vaccines and monoclonal antibodies and shared them around the world, including the monoclonal antibody we called MAB114 that was found in 2018 in eastern Congo to be an effective treatment for Ebola disease. So it is now the VRC's first licensed product. Uh, if you need it, it's called Ibanga. You should remember that name. And we're faced with uh, emerging infections, and we're going to continue to be faced with uh, new emerging infectious diseases. And I think we've learned together over this last couple of years that traditional public health measures are effective, but limited. And we're in this pivotal time now, I think, in history where all of a sudden, over the last 10 to 15 years, these new types of technologies applied to vaccinology have really changed our options and changed the way we think about vaccines and have turned it into more of an engineering exercise that can be modular and put on a time schedule. And if you think of, if you look back at the history of vaccine development, I'm listing the licensed vaccines on the left. If you look at this, um, almost all of vaccines that were developed came opportunistically because of new technology developments. And these first two from Jenner and Pasteur, smallpox and rabies, they were done before we knew what a virus was, before we knew what an immune system was. And the vaccines were actually made and grown on, in animal tissue, in live animals, on the hide of a cow or in the spinal cord of a dog or a rabbit. And somehow uh, they figured out a way to make that work. But the next ones uh, came because good pasture learned how to grow viruses and eggs. The next ones because Ender et al. Uh, learned how to grow viruses in cell culture to grow high titer virus that could either be given as a live attenuated or whole inactivated virus. And then beginning in the 1980s, molecular biology allowed us to make recombinant proteins, virus-like particles, 
molecular clones, uh, reassortants, and we had a new cluster of vaccines evolve. And recently, you saw uh, the VSV recombinant vector for Ebola uh, was licensed for, for prevention of Ebola. And it was, I think, part of the new era that we're in now, which I think is largely going to be structure-based design oriented. And we thought RSV might be the first good example of that, but it's not finished yet. And coronavirus snuck in ahead of that and not only use structural biology techniques and gene-based delivery, but a lot of these other technologies have been applied to the coronavirus vaccine development process. And it's really ushered in this new era of vaccinology. These technologies can be divided in, uh, roughly into things that improve precision of antigen design. I'm listing here, I won't go through all of those or uh, speed. So some of the technologies are uh, helping us make better vaccine antigens. Some of the technologies are allowing us to go faster. And those roughly correspond to what we need to, uh, for pre uh, pandemic preparedness and pandemic response. We've conceived of uh, pandemic preparedness in this uh, way after living through the experiences of multiple uh, pandemic threats over the previous 10 years and uh, proposed a prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness. With the technologies we have now, we think this is feasible and the proposal is to divide up the 26 virus families into four basic groups based on mechanisms of entry with either class one or class two or class three fusion proteins or non-envelope viruses and focus on solutions for the 120 or so viruses that comprise those 26 families known to infect humans. And for at least 30 of the prototypes, take something all the way through phase one testing and demonstration that it is at least immunogenic and safe ahead of any of the next pandemic threats. And for the other 90, take those concepts at least through animal testing. And this is a large but tractable uh, type of program, although it would take probably 10 or 20 years to accomplish. This thinking is based in part on our findings from respiratory syncytial virus Back in the 2010 to 12 uh, timeframe, uh, Jason McClellan, who was working in Peter Kwong's lab at the time, and I collaborated and were able to capture this structure of the pre-fusion form of the RSV fusion protein. This is a protein analogous to spike on coronaviruses. It's a class one fusion protein that undergoes a big conformational transformation to mediate membrane fusion for viral entry to occur. And the big unexpected finding was that there is a patch on top at the apex of this molecule that is neutralization sensitive area that does not exist on this post-fusion molecule. And it explains why five or six large efficacy trials over the last 30 years focused on using this molecule of F as a vaccine could only boost neutralizing activity by two to three fold on average. But if you stabilize this prefusion structure and maintain these neutralization sensitive epitopes by adding a C terminal trimerization domain and internal disulfide and cavity filling mutations, you can now have a vaccine antigen that can boost neutralizing activity by 16 to 20 fold. And that now makes it a candidate for maternal immunization that could boost antibody long enough to last for six months or so and for a vaccine for, for the elderly. Just to make sure you understand this dramatic rearrangement process, I'm showing you a video at the bottom, the virus is on the bottom, the host cells on top, and these proteins start out in one conformation, the top unravels, inserts the fusion peptide into the host cell membrane, then the heptad repeat regions pull it back together to mediate membrane fusion, and that allows the viral nucleocapsid to get into the host cell. 
So targeting this end-up structure is not going to be effective. That's a non-functional spent protein. Targeting this prefusion structure uh, shown here is where you're going to get the most uh, value in terms of uh, interfering with function. This vaccine has now been shown to effectively induce high levels of neutralizing antibody that are prefusion confirmation specific because you can deplete the antibody with the postfusion or compete with postfusion and still maintain this high level of antibody response but not when you compete with prefusion. And you can show that these uh, B cells on this flow cytometry probing B cells with either the prefusion or postfusion form of F, the vaccine is inducing a high pre-F exclusive or pre-F preferring set of B cell responses and some dual binding that bind both forms of the antigen. But the reason this is important is because pre-F specific antibodies in general on average are 10 to 20 fold more potent in neutralizing activity than the ones that are dual binding. And the ones that bind the post-fusion F exclusively uh, really don't have neutralizing activity at all. And if you boost people with the pre-F form, as we have here, you see an induction or a in, uh, induction of a large pre-F specific uh, response. And if you boost people with the post-F form of F as Metamune did with their latest trial, you're really only boosting the responses to the dual binding antibodies. So there are other class one fusion proteins. Class one fusion proteins are on paramyxal viruses and many of the other viruses that we think about, envelope viruses like influenza, HIV, Ebola, Lassa, all have class one fusion proteins that are characterized by this fusion machinery, either with an intervening piece or this cap on top that has to come off for the machinery to work. And coronaviruses have both. They have the fusion machinery, the intervening piece and the cap. And uh, the cap has to come off, so targeting the cap uh, primarily is, the, is, is where most of the neutralizing activity resides. And so although these fusion proteins have different shapes and uh, different topography, they share a lot of the motifs and domains and have functional homology. And so you learn a lot, not only within a family, but across what family members. And so after an experience in 2016 with Zika where we made a DNA vaccine and Moderna made an RNA vaccine with essentially the same sequence, uh, we were working together in a government uh, uh, managed program, the Zika leadership group. And we compared their DNA to our, uh, their, our, their RNA to our DNA in, in monkey experiments and found that 10 micrograms of RNA was as potent as four milligrams of our DNA. And we decided to make a deal with them. We'd been working with them some for the last few years, but uh, combining this pandemic preparedness approach for prototypes, uh, precision antigen design and their rapid manufacturing we focused on two viral families, the paramyxoviridae and coronaviridae, using Nipah as a prototype and MERS coronavirus as a prototype. And uh, by the time uh, of 2000, end of 2019, we had designed antigens for Nipah, designed antigens for the spike of MERS coronavirus, and had already proven that mRNA delivery or protein delivery of either of these could prevent uh, lethal, uh, could protect animals against lethal challenges with these two viruses. So the reason we chose mRNA as a part of this pandemic preparedness strategy is, uh, I'm trying to show here, but there's many reasons that RNA is a good choice. It's that authentic antigen presentation. It can induce both antibodies and CD8 T cells. It has a Th1 or gamma interferon bias CD4 T cell response. The vaccine components are rapidly degraded. It only requires entry into the cytoplasm, unlike DNA, which has to get all the way into the nucleus, and most of it gets stuck in the cytoplasm. 
when DNA goes into the nucleus, it's often episomal there for many months, whereas mRNA is, is gone within a few hours. There's no anti-vector immunity as there is with pox or adenovirus vectors. It is chemically synthesized, so you don't need bioreactors. You don't need large footprint manufacturing programs. And it's very rapid, even more rapid than what we could do with DNA. So mRNA is encapsulated in this lipid nanoparticle, which is comprised of four different lipids that not only protects it from degradation, but enter, uh, helps it uh, enter into the cytoplasm where it's translated into these proteins. And in this case, the spike is membrane anchored and maintained in this prefusion uh, uh, conformation. And there's different types of RNA. You can have an amplifying, self-amplifying RNA, what's uh, SAM technology, which uses the alpha virus amplicon to make many, many transcripts and a lot of protein production quickly. You can use unmodified RNA, which is sort of the Goldilocks in between version. And then you can use a modified RNA. In this case, one methyl uridine or pseudouridine is a concept pioneered by Caitlin Carrico and Drew Weissman. And when you use modified uridines, uh, you can largely avoid the signaling that occurs through TLR7 and TLR3 and the cytoplasmic rig I and MDA5, all of which channel into creating a type 1 interferon response. So you can reduce the overall inflammation and innate uh, immune signaling, and that allows protein trans, uh, production to go on longer and seems to promote T follicular helper cell production, et cetera, and makes it more immunogenic. So for paramyxoviruses, looking at NEPA, uh, the F protein uh, is a class one fusion protein. We learned how to stabilize that in the prefusion conformation. But in paramyxoviruses, they also have an attachment protein that's called G or H or HN, depending on its hemagglutinin properties. And a lot of times it's the attachment protein that's the better neutralizing target, but sometimes the F protein is the better neutralizing target and some of the paramyxoviridae. And so we thought it was important to have a vaccine that represented both antigens, not only for the breadth of neutralizing and targeting, but for uh, ex expanding the amount of CD4 T cell uh, help. So with NEPA, we learned how to stabilize that and showed that the pre-F indeed was much more immunogenic than the uh, unstabilized, the non-stabilized version. Did the same thing with measles and mumps. And then learned how to make a chimeric molecule where the pre-F uh, had a trimerization domain fold on it, followed by three attachment proteins. And that is the vaccine uh, antigen that has been effective against uh, NEPA, and we were planning to use that NEPA mRNA in a clinical trial in the first quarter of 2020, but um, that was the agreement we had with Moderna, but uh, when we found out about the, the new coronavirus, we flipped it to uh, using uh, the coronavirus as our proof of concept. The reason is because when Jason moved to uh, Dartmouth in 2013, we uh, decided to extend our findings on RSV to other envelope viruses, and we worked together on coronaviruses, and around 2016, in collaboration with Andrew Ward, were able to capture the structure of the spike protein of the first human uh, HKU1 beta, uh, beta coronavirus shown here. And once we had that structure, uh, going through the process of stabilization found that this two-proline substitution at the top of the central helix that prevents that rearrangement of the heptad repeat and the unfolding of the fusion machinery largely stabilized the protein. And once we had that, putting analogous uh, mutations into either MERS or the original SARS or about 12 other coronaviruses, it worked in all of those systems. So that preserved the neutralization-sensitive epitopes on the cap, 
But more importantly, for gene-based delivery, it improved overall level of protein expression. So for MERS, for instance, it increased the level of expression by over 50-fold. You can't really see the blue line here, but the stabilized version has a very good expression. So for those two reasons, it made sense to do this for a vaccine antigen. So when we heard about SARS or this new virus at the end of December, we then learned um, around January 6th, it was probably a beta coronavirus. It's a virus that infects the upper and lower airways. And this is an image of it infecting airway, ciliated airway epithelium. You see some of it trapped in mucus. And these are small spher spherical uh, objects with these large knobs. Uh, the main surface feature of the virus is this knob, and it's, that is the spike protein. So it's not surprising that the main focus of vaccine development around the world was uh, on the spike protein. That is the main uh, target for attacking this virus. And now there's over 300 different vaccine development programs around the world, and over 100 of them have now reached clinical evaluation, and several are in phase three, and some registered. So to, Nucleic acid, whole and activated, recombinant vector, and subunit proteins have all now achieved authorization someplace in the world um, for effectively preventing uh, this coronavirus, and they're all focused on spike. And so uh, on January 6th, we agreed with uh, Moderna that we'd switch our program to corona instead of paramyxoviruses, and when we received the sequences on the 10th, it allowed us to design constructs to make protein, to solve the structure, to make uh, assays, to immunize mice, and to uh, make a vaccine as we did. The phase one started in about 65 days after the sequences were available. It could have started about uh, 45 days if we had already done a phase one with the MERS prototype. So we could have saved a couple of weeks or uh, even there. Other preparation could have saved months. And you know we, we could have probably started phase three in at least June if we had already uh, gone through the process of transitioning from a phase one to phase three trial in a crisis. So we got to phase three in about six months and but, uh, with preparation, we could have done it a lot faster. And we were only able to go as fast as we did because of all this prior work on coronavirus structure, stabilization, and mapping neutralizing sites. And that was only possible because of the prior work on RSV. And it was all motivated by this thinking about pandemic preparedness. And so could be thought of as a one-year story, but it's really uh, a different uh, story of many more years. One of the great benefits of uh, this technology is that the same kind of uh, reagents that you use to make the vaccine can be used for other purposes. So, for instance, we've been working with a company, Abcelera, to look for cross-reactive coronavirus antibodies and so when we got convalescent PBMCs, we'd already designed a spike probe uh, for the new virus. And working with them, we're able to rapidly find highly potent neutralizing antibodies that Lilly then, in collaboration, uh, was able to take into phase three within about five months. And that's also now resulted in licensed uh, or authorized products for treatment of uh, coronavirus. So. The technologies not only support things that can lead to prevention uh, options, but also to treatment options. Starting with uh, knowing the protein structure and knowing that it's in the right conformation then is really the basis for everything going forward. And it's what allows you to have the confidence to make the assays, to discover the antibodies, and to make the vaccines. And this structure and the stabilized uh, version of the structure with the two proline substitution has been used not just in the Moderna vaccine, but it's also the basis for the Pfizer, the J&J &J ad vector 
It's also in the Novavax and the Sanofi subunits that haven't yet hit the market. But it is in the subunit in Taiwan for Metagen that has been authorized for use there. So people have worried that this was done too quickly and they're not confident of the process because uh, it was uh, authorized within about a year. But as I said, it's also a three-year story with the Moderna collaboration on pandemic preparedness. It's an eight-year story on paramyxo uh, virus and coronavirus uh, class one fusion protein antigen design. It's a longer story for some of these other uh, technologies that are needed, like the nucleic acid modified uridines, all the work on other viruses. And really, I think it's a 40-year story because of all the work that was done earlier, as you may have heard about, on vaccine-enhanced illness research on RSV, which turned out to be relevant during this pandemic. And all of it was driven by the work on trying to make an HIV vaccine. So it, all that work some people may think was uh, not useful or that the money was wasted because we still don't have an HIV vaccine, but it is an example of how uh, basic research and applied research over time create solutions for things that are beyond what you're actually working on. So during that year, uh, everything happened just on time. We had mouse immunogenicity just before phase one, monkey immunogenicity just before phase two. And then we had human immunogenicity that was in the upper quartile of convalescent responses to infection before we started phase three. And also had evidence of protection against upper and lower airway infection in both mice and monkeys by the time we started phase three, and evidence that we had a Th1 biased response, uh, which we thought was compatible with vaccine safety based on our prior work with RSV. We were also able to show that uh, the mRNA not only worked in younger adults, but in middle-aged and older adults at a level very similar to that of young adults. And so it was also effective in the elderly who also had a Th1 bias response. And as you all know, um, these results came out at last November. And just to briefly review that uh, these two lines for the Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, and Moderna studies showed that not only were the vaccines highly effective, these are the accumulation of cases in the control groups, but you can see these lines separating before the second dose. So these vaccines effectiveness was, was starting to show up by around 10 to 14 days after the first immunization, and then was just uh, propelled by the second immunization. So in the end of December, we started vaccinating our frontline workers, our colleagues and co-workers and students. This is Dr. Corbett, who's a fellow in my lab at the time and managed a lot of this early work that got to the phase one trial so quickly. And I think she was here maybe last year to talk to you all. She is now an assistant professor at Harvard in the TH Chan School of Public Health. We've also been celebrating vaccines uh, with VIPs and with family members, church members, and I recently visited Jason McClellan, my long-term collaborator in Austin, and in honor of vaccine celebration, they even lit up the tower on campus, and that has only been done in the past for NCAA championship football teams. <laughs> so we felt pretty special that day. And now we have real world effectiveness data in Israel who really got out more quickly than most other countries and started immunizing, especially in the older age groups first. They've been able to estimate that by immunizing as early as they did, which was still a year into the pandemic, that they probably reduced the number of overall infections by about a third and reduced the overall number of deaths by about two thirds. So the vaccine has had real world effectiveness and 
You may have seen this graph recently from the New York Times based on CDC data. But people say, well, you still see people who get sick and still have to be hospitalized even though they're vaccinated. But if you look uh, by cases per 100,000 at people who are unvaccinated versus people who are vaccinated, both in terms of the cases, but even more importantly, in terms of the deaths, that the unvaccinated people have a 12 times higher chance of dying from a coronavirus infection than the people who have been vaccinated. So there's much more risk from the infection than there is from the vaccine. And yet, uh, it's been hard to fully celebrate because we've had over 5 million deaths in the world and because this pandemic has also revealed or uncovered or uh, highlighted and magnified what we already knew about healthcare disparities in our country and in, in our world. And the, the uh, degree of devastation that's occurred has not been uniform. And for one thing, the US has been harder hit than other uh, comparable countries around the world where um, average life expectancy in other countries uh, fell a little bit, but in the US it fell by almost two years, which is the most it's dropped in a year since 1918. And in uh, uh, other uh, ethnic demographics, Hispanics and Blacks, the result was even more devastating. They lost four or three years of life expectancy during this 2020, and it may be even more through 2021. So this is a primary summary. So I've got a little bit more after this, but uh, what we've done is show a proof of concept that this prototype pathogen approach for pandemic preparedness can indeed uh, help things go a bit faster. And the re rapid response was based on prior fundamental basic and translational research. I can't emphasize this enough. This started really as a basic research problem to just see what is the shape of the F protein and how does it work. It was not really a vaccine program in the beginning. It requires both precision and speed. Going fast without using the right antigen I don't think is going to work and vice versa. Having a good antigen that takes 10 years to make is not going to help you either. And in this country at least, having a pre-established public-private partnership where there was already trust and uh, ability to make rapid decisions was critical. But what it's uncovered as well as the healthcare disparities is there's a, a real problem with vaccine and biology understanding in high income countries. And there's a even bigger problem with manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries. So I'm gonna thank the PIs and Jason McClellan and my lab group, Dr. Corbett is somewhat hiding here. The industry partner, Moderna, Vanderbilt, Mark Dennison and Ralph Barrick at UNC and these other groups, especially DMID, which manage most of the advanced clinical trials and these network consortia that came together to, to get all these more than 200,000 people enrolled in phase three trials in about six months and these other industry groups. And I just want to say one thing about, I think, what's possible going forward. And cellular doesn't mean cells. It means cell phones. And it just is an example of how you can, with new technology, sometimes you can skip generations of technology. And if you look here at the beginning, 20 years ago, of access to cell phone and really just communication in general, the disparity with cell phones, skipping the whole cable process has almost been closed. And this has opened up all sorts of op opportunities economically and just in terms of education. And so the cell phone revolution in Africa is an example of how technology can change things. And so we've gone from this kind of technology and skipped that generation and just gone straight to satellites and cell phone towers. 
In the same way, uh, historically, vaccines have required a whole campus full of bioreactors to actually make a product. And now, with a small footprint machine that can manufacture RNA and a modular containment facility that can be dropped just about anywhere on Earth, I think we're at a place where we have an op opportunity to really change the way vaccine manufacturing and distribution of access to these kind of uh, facilities uh, really has a chance to take a big step forward. And that's what I hope to spend more of my time on. And just to conclude uh, again, solving this basic research uh, question about atomic structure led to finding this target of vulnerability. There's a proof of concept for structure-based vaccine design. The RSV work uh, uh, prepared us for the coronavirus work. And we think stabilizing class one fusion proteins is now a generalizable approach, at least for that uh, group of seven or eight uh, uh, families of envelope viruses. And that new technologies, especially structure, protein engineering, RNA, and single cell analysis are transforming vaccinology and gave us, have given us options for things that are either gonna solve longstanding problems, uh, create new vaccines for things like measles, uh, for which we're still making vaccines with 50-year-old technology and 50-year-old equipment that's becoming harder and harder to maintain and new options for uh, pandemic preparedness. So I will stop there and take any questions. So thank you so much, Barney, for, for taking us through all of your accomplishments and talking a bit about your vision for the future and your role in that vision. So, I'm going to ask our panelists um, to join us uh, up here at the table. And, and while, they're, while they're coming forward, I have a question for you, which is, it's about the prototype pathogen approach. And what I'm wondering is, of course, there are other organizations that are thinking about pathogens and, um, and pandemic preparedness. And how does the NIH prototype pathogen approach square with CEPI or the WHO blueprint? Are people thinking, you know, as one? Or do you think there's some, some disparity in, in how people are thinking about this? Well, NIAD has embraced this concept and is going to make a big investment. And it's been embraced also at, at the Office of Technology and Science Policy level, mm -hmm. embracing this concept. CEPI has embraced this concept. And I think uh, other groups around the world are seeing the value in this concept, but it's a little hard uh, to embrace this until we get more equitable and distributed research and manufacturing capacity. Because some of these targets, some of these viral families are threats mostly in low and middle income countries. And until people can solve their own problems, and have tools to solve their own problems and, and regionally, then I think we're gonna continue to suffer under these pandemic threats. So it's, it's in our global best interest to facilitate the self-care that these regions need in order to solve their own problems and take care of their own surge capacity. So instead of vaccinating the world in three or four years, we vaccinate the world in three months. Otherwise, we're going to lose out to variants that are going to escape our vaccines and treatments. And, uh, you know, we, we have to do this in a, in a different and better way. I, I know we'll probably have a lot more discussion on, on this point. So at this point, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Maybe we'll start with you, Anna. I'm Anna Durbin. I'm uh, head of health research since 1999. I'm at the Immunization Research and just recently became the director when Ruth stepped down earlier in September and have worked with Barney for many years as well. And it's really a pleasure to have him here today for all of the wonderful, wonderful work that he's done. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Rupali LeMay. I'm an associate scientist in the Department of International Health. I'm actually a behavioral and social scientist studying more about uh, vaccine behavior and trying to increase uptake. So thank you, Dr. Graham, for your, for your lecture. Uh, greetings. My name is Bill Moss. I'm a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, International Health, and Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. I'm also the executive director of the International Vaccine Access Center. And I started my career here many years ago in the laboratory of Diane Griffin working on measles and measles vaccines. And I thank you, uh, Dr. Graham, as well. I'm a recipient of the Moderna vaccine, so I have a, paternal, uh, a, a personal indebtedness <laughs> to you. <laughs> That's great. So, Anna, maybe we'll, we'll start off with you for the round of questions. Sure, because I'm, I'm really interested in, um, you know, global vaccine access and development. I mean, I've seen this as a huge problem with the current pandemic. And so I have one question sort of that's in the weeds, and then I want to take that question to see how we bring it out to help the world. So my first question is, with these vaccines, how do we get all of the resources, I'm thinking of all of the nucleotides that are needed to make these vaccines for billions of doses? And we use those for sequencing, we use those for testing. So where do all, is there ever you know, a concern that we are low on reagents? How do we ensure that sort of the pipeline of reagents to create these vaccines is enough? Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great thing to think about, but... Um... We didn't know if scaling up mRNA was even feasible because it's never been scaled up beyond a few thousand doses until uh, early in 2020. Unfortunately, with the big infusion of money, the companies were able to take the risk of scaling up ahead of the time we even knew that it would work. And so work was being done all through the year to see if you could establish the supply chain of nucleotides and lipids to even make that much RNA. And, and that supply chain has been built out over these last uh, 18 months. And so it's pretty robust. And you know, there's a lot of opportunity for people to make nucleotides and make lipids and really contribute to the, the supply chain going forward, at least for mRNA. But uh, what you're bringing up is uh, even more important uh, in considering how to build the capacity in low and middle income countries, because it's not as simple as just dropping a building into the jungle and hoping that you can make something happen. Because uh, the example I like to use is, you know, if you don't have a technician who knows how to calibrate micropipettes, then you can't start a program. If you don't have somebody who can fix a centrifuge or tune up a flow cytometer, if you don't have that kind of baseline technical support, let alone the reagents, uh, you cannot start a program. So this building out of capacity has to start at a very basic technical level so you can build up to having the capacity to run even what could be a relatively simple GMP unit. So that supply chain concept, I think, is really important, and it is not solved. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you again, Dr. Graham, for your talk. It's nice to meet a fellow Kansan also and fellow <laughs> Jayhawker. I felt like I needed to say that. Um, for many of us that work in the international space, you know, I think we've been talking a lot about the issue, and you had your slide on disparities specifically related to populations here in the United States. But I guess the question is for me and for many of us that work in lower and middle income countries, what is the one thing the U.S. really could be doing to really increase access rapidly around the world? I think many of us, including Bill and I, work internationally overseas, and we've been working with country governments, working with COVAX, to try to better think about efficiently how to deliver vaccines. But it seems as though it's still running into a number of issues. And so I'm just wondering, what is sort of your one key takeaway, if we could really focus on, that would help us really get vaccines out to lower middle income settings? Well, first of all, you can't solve this during a crisis. Mm -hmm. It has to be solved when there's not, you're not in the middle of a crisis. And secondly, you have to create solutions that are not uh, election cycle, four year plans. You have to get a 20 to 40 year plan. And you cannot just 
plan something to happen in two to three or four years so you can get reelected. Because uh, those plans always involve high income countries making enough that can drip over into Africa or some other uh, place. And, and that is not going to solve the problem. It, just making more and giving it uh, is not solving the problem. The problem has to be solved locally, I, I believe. I think each region has their own set of problems. Like Australia has Ross River and Barma Forest alpha viruses that, you know, it's infecting 50 to 100,000 people every year. It's not considered big enough for a market to make a product, but it needs to be made because that could be a pandemic threat. And Mexico has Myora virus, and Nigeria has Lassa virus, and Kenya has Rift Valley fever virus. All of these things uh, need to be solved at a regional level because it's a regional problem. And with small footprint, small batch manufacturing technology, it can become more economically feasible to do that. So to me, it's in the world's, the bigger world's best interest to not give things away, but to support the development of things so people can solve their own problems. And they can do research on their own local regional threats that can become global threats and then when they have that capacity, they can do their own surge capacity work so that everybody can make their own vaccines and everybody gets vaccinated more quickly instead of waiting for the excess to, to dribble out. It's not in anybody's best interest for it to keep working this way. And it's, if we keep it this way, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, we're going to pay the price later on. And I, I don't know if uh, there's going to be enough political will once this pandemic sort of fades away to sustain that type of thinking. But right now, there's quite a bit of momentum and interest around the world to try to make some of this happen. And so if we can get more places to be where India was 30 years ago, India now is pretty much self uh, contained uh, has independent vaccine technology and expertise and can not only make but discover and develop their own vaccines. And so where India was 30 years ago is where we are now in a lot of other places. And we need to try to make that happen, not in 30 years, but maybe in 10 years. May I ask a quick follow-up mm -hmm. to that? Because I think one of one of the things that I'm very interested in is, is if even we have that local ability to make vaccines, will the technology be transferred? Will they be given the technology in a way that they can afford to make these vaccines in-house? Because I, th I see that as a huge obstacle as well. Well, um, I'm not sure that that's... Uh, going to happen and because it's it's not just giving products it's giving if if we give if the technology is given from a company by the time it gets to a developing country it's probably going to be two or three generations old mm -hmm. and i i think there needs to be a new paradigm for that as well and that because I, I don't see. think we can count on the companies yeah. i think there has to be uh, academic and philanthropy and government efforts to build new technology using the resources we have to make a better RNA vaccine in South Africa that is a generation beyond what Moderna has now. Because the technology is facile enough, I think, that if you give people the right tools and reagents, they could actually make another step. While these companies are so busy making money and making product, this group could make a better mRNA. And then they have their own technology. I think that's the kind of thing that has to happen. We shouldn't wait for the technology to dribble out of the country. It I has was thinking, to happen yeah. locally. I was thinking more in terms of this current pandemic, for instance, if that mRNA technology were transferred to a company like Serum Institute or other 
vaccine manufacturers that have established, could we have had more doses available? And I think, you know, it, it, it's, it is very, um, I would say, advanced technology that Sarah may not be able to utilize. But I do, you know, we keep hearing, oh, there's going to be enough doses for the world. There's going to be enough doses for the world. But we see that that just has not happened. It's, it's not happening, but transferring that technology in the middle of a crisis is also not going to happen fast enough. I, I mean, I think it's going to take three to five years, even if you built a new plant and gave everything that Moderna and BioNTech know to some other place. Mm -hmm. It's going to take them three to five years to really get up and going where they can do this on a large scale. It's, it's not something we can do in the middle of the crisis. And so for for the next two or three years, I think the really the only solution is giving the vaccine from a high income country to low income country. But looking forward to the next pandemic, that's not the way we want to do things. Right. That's not the way it should be done. Thank you. One of the things that I'm um, most proud about that not many people know about is that uh, at the beginning of this, uh, we started working with Medigen. And the reason we did that, Anna, is because of you and Steve Whitehead, <laughs> who have your uh, dengue va yep. vaccine with them, uh, suggested that they could be a good partner. And so we started working with them, and they don't know how to do mRNA, but they know how to make protein. Yep. And so we helped, uh, we made parallel so cell lines they did the process development, and we did the animal studies. And they now have a subunit spike protein that has been authorized for use in Taiwan. I saw that. It's wonderful. And yeah. it is the first domestic vaccine Taiwan has ever made and had authorized. So it is a, it's an example of what a country can do mm -hmm. with, not, with just a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. They now made their own cell line, made their own vaccine, have their own product that's been authorized. And for the first time, and now Taiwan has this capacity to maybe take care of their own thing the next time. And it's not a low-income country, but it's the kind of thing that I think could happen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll stay, uh, I'll stay with the same theme. Um, I'd be inter you mentioned a, a paradigm shift, and I'd be interested in your thoughts as whether there needs to be a concurrent paradigm shift in the regulatory processes, and are there risks in vaccine safety or mistrust uh, if, this, if the manufacturing is, is made too widespread? Right. Well, um, it, it has to be regulated, and it has to be done the right way, and so there has to be some process for regulating it. And what would be nice is if there could be regional processes, not just to uh, oversee manufacturing, but if there could be, you know, if, if uh, Vietnam and Thailand and Australia and Indonesia and everybody in that area got together and had regulatory authorities, not only to supervise the manufacturing, but to authorize uh, the efficacy studies that had to be done in the middle of the crisis. Because if, if you don't get your answer in the middle of the pandemic, and you don't get an efficacy result, you can't get a product licensed, and companies won't work on things that cannot get licensed. So there has to be a, a quicker process for getting things into an efficacy trial, and a quicker and a better process for regulating regional uh, manufacturing processes so you can harmonize them across. There has to be this harmonization of best practices across, across regions. And so I, I think that smaller region problem solving, but bigger region uh, regulatory processes, I think, need to happen. And, it, and it's, uh, I don't know how we get there, but I think that's the kind of thing that has to happen. Now, Africa got there to a, a large extent during Ebola in 2014, as this organization called ABREF, a regulatory group of consortium of now more than two dozen countries, are working together to share best practices, share expertise, and to really have a more robust regulatory structure across more of Africa. Mm -hmm. 
So I think it's possible. The question is whether people will be motivated to do that during peacetime mm -hmm. when we're not in the middle of the war. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we'll open up a little bit to the audience. There are microphones on either side. I wonder if, if folks have questions that they'd like to raise. And maybe while we're, they're migrating over, I don't know if our, if our um, panel has any additional questions also. Anything? No, I think. OK. <laughs> Okay. So I'll, I'll focus on lessons you learned or you, you learned from this process in accelerating the vaccination vaccine development and thinking about our failures to develop standardized high quality mask uh, diagnostic and other approaches. Uh, have we learned anything from one that could be extended to the other, both in terms of organization, oversight, acceleration? Right, the vaccines have gotten a lot of attention during this whole process, but uh, obviously we need diagnostics, we need antivirals, we need deployment strategies for the end game, we need better surveillance in the early part, and we need better uh, supply chains for even things like masks. And, uh, and then we need better education to get people to comply with these things. You know, it, it, you see all these pictures from 1918 and whole uh, huge armies of policemen and nurses and everybody has masks on and it almost feels like before the flu virus wasn't even discovered until the 1930s. So they were dealing with this pandemic. They didn't even know the virus, the cause of it. And yet, at least in the pictures, everybody seemed to get the idea. Yes, it's a good idea to wear a mask. And so in the bigger pandemic preparedness plan, uh, it's not just about vaccines, but as, as I tried to illustrate, the vaccine technology includes the reagents that can make therapeutics from biologics and getting structures of not just the surface proteins, but the polymerases and proteases of all these different viruses and having the structure in hand ahead of time and working on molecules that can interfere with those mechanisms. I think the same kind of concept can be applied to antiviral development. And schools of public health might be able to solve the early surveillance part and the later deployment part and you know, maybe not the, the the manufacturing in the middle, but I don't know what to do about uh, the surveillance part. Seems sort of obvious. It just is a matter of political will and getting some facilities built. But the deployment part, the end game of once you have something, how do you get it delivered? That is, uh, we I think we've haven't done very well during this. Bernie, my name is Amita Gupta. I'm a professor of medicine and infectious diseases and international health, and I really enjoyed your presentation. I have two questions. Um, the first is, um, what do you think the sort of mRNA platform is really going to, you know, what are the next exciting candidates that are going to be launched as a result of the technology um, based on sort of, what, and where do you think the priority should be spent around um, investment? Well, Moderna has reported that, um, They've used one of the RSV stabilized F protein constructs and delivered that by mRNA and have gotten 20-fold boost in nude activity. So they're already testing that in the elderly as a way of boosting RSV. And, and as a gene-based delivery approach, it could be used for younger children as well. I, I'm not sure the pro, we're ready for protein vaccination of young children yet, but. So RSV is on the docket. They also have a CMV product that has the five uh, genes for the pentameric piece and the one gene for GB. And it looks pretty good. And once we have a way of stabilizing GB in its prefusion form, I think it could actually be a really good CMV vaccine and maybe be uh, a way of getting to other herpes virus vaccines. And 
Uh, there's other way you can also deliver particle-based things, like uh, you can make a virus-like particle a protein shell of an alpha virus pretty readily now that we know how to do that. And that can be delivered by mRNA. mRNA might be able to be used in combination vaccines. Uh, you can deliver up to 20 to 30 different genes at the same time encapsulated in one of these little lipid nanoparticles. And uh, you can show that virtually all of them get expressed. So I think the technology for mRNA opens up a lot of new possibilities, but I have to stress again that if you don't deliver the right thing, mRNA is not going to be magic. It, it's got to be delivering an antigen that actually makes sense and that's going to work. So it's going to be transformative in terms of a simple process, a very, it's the most elemental way to make a vaccine. You have a single strand of RNA, it goes in the cytoplasm, it's gone in a few hours, and it makes a protein that works. And so it's a very easy, simple thing to do, but uh, you got to make the right protein. And so it's going to open up a lot of things, I think, but also has a few caveats. Great. And I, the second question follows on sort of your wonderful inspiration of how HIV vaccine science has really led to the sort of and years of investment, 40 plus years. So the NIH has these international clinical trial sites. And um, I think part of the, the lesson of COVID was that some, several of them were sort of leveraged to provide um, emphasis for testing new therapies. And so I'd be interested sort of here from your point of view, is that going to be a model that you think by making pluripotent sort of uh, studies, having global collaboration is going to be a way we're going to efficiently move product, or do we just really have to do this through the private sector um, because of time and speed? Right. Well, the limitation in this country is that virtually everything that can be distributed and marketed and sold has to come out of a private industry. Uh, the U.S. government will not market and sell and distribute. Mm -hmm. Other countries don't necessarily have that limitation. There are government-owned facilities in Brazil and Sao Paulo and Rio that could do that sort of thing. Some of the Indian manufacturers are really kind of government-oriented, and some of the places in Asia and Vietnam and Thailand are somewhat government. So I, I think, um, to me, using public dollars to do public health makes a lot more sense than expecting private companies to solve public health problems. It doesn't make sense to me that they will be able to do that on a broad scale. So I think, I don't know that that can ever change in this country, but I think it could be Im implemented that way in developing countries. Thanks. So I'm just going to take a prerogative before these couple of questions to ask a follow-on to one of Amita's questions. And it has to do with, you know, mRNA as a delivery truck, essentially. Um, you know, so you need that technology in country. But I was thinking also about the structural biology capacity. I mean, the reason you knew what to put into the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was because of all the work that you and Jason had done for many years before. And I'm wondering about building that capacity in countries, and is that a harder capacity to build if countries are, in fact, going to determine what antigens they, they want, what pathogens they want to protect against? Is yeah. that a harder, harder lift, bigger lift? Well, I'd like to get there, but you know, if, if Medigen can make enough money in Taiwan, maybe they can build their own and get their own $3 million Creos Titan cryo-electron microscope. And I mean, the technology and the equipment for that kind of work is really expensive. And it seems like we may need to build out other places before we get to that. It's, it's just, or there needs to be partnerships. You know, if Johns Hopkins has one of the greatest structural biology groups in the world, I mean, they could partner with people in uh, Lagos, and as you are already solving the Lhasa virus uh, uh, fusion protein structure. And, but I don't know if you have that partnership in Nigeria. I know you're working on Lhasa. I just don't know if, you're, if you've got the uh, partnership. 
So I also didn't answer uh, your other question at the, at the end there about these uh, prospective cohorts. Uh, philanthropy groups and government groups don't like to fund prospective cohorts because it's this, uh, you know, you start it and then it's just this huge growing expense and you don't know what you're getting out of it. But if you could fund, if you could justify the funding of prospective cohorts and make them cost effective or cost efficient by not only using them to do surveillance and maybe looking for new blips or pathogens or entry of things into human populations, but also have them serve as the cohort that would go right into efficacy trials and have it serve both ends of that spectrum and other things in between. You need to find multiple purposes for your cohorts. Otherwise, the government funding groups, I've heard these discussions at NIH, I, we're not going to start another prospective cohort because it's just an endless expense and you never know what you're going to get out of it. So you have, have to figure out ways of making it more multi-purpose. Well, thank, thank you, Barney, for another inspiring talk. And you may have touched on this already, but I felt like I just had to ask you what your, in the past couple of years, all that's happened as you reflect how does what we've learned or does what we've learned apply to, say, like HIV and HIV vaccines going forward? Is there anything that comes out that stands out that you think might help in that right. area? Well, um, you know, HIV was on my last slide because it was <laughs> HIV that led to... But now there's a lot of ways that this stuff can lead back to HIV. And I was talking to Stuart about this uh, earlier and... So, you know, for HIV, you need to solve conformational evasion, immunodominance, genetic, antigenic variation, and glycan shield. All these different problems with the glycoprotein, you have to solve how to get antibodies at the right angle going into the right places. And RSV's only problem was conformational evasion. That worked. And I think we kind of have that part of HIV solved. We're learning about immunodominance and antigenic variation in new ways using mosaic antigen displays on nanoparticles to kind of get to subdominant responses. Coronavirus has a lot of glycans and other things do, and HCV has some of the same issues that HIV has, but it's maybe slightly more tractable. It, it, you can sometimes cure yourself of, H, of HCV, where that never happens in HIV. So I don't know, if you add up all the different thing, pieces we're learning from other viruses, maybe we'll be able to go back and have an mRNA that expresses a mosaic nanoparticle with, you know, with all the right conformations and whatever Stuart figures out for HCV that can also <laughs> be applied there and, and maybe we can get back to HIV eventually, I don't know. Yeah, so thanks, Martin, for the talk. Uh, the um, mRNA vaccines have a fantastic uh, opportunities in many ways, as we've already talked about, but they're still delivered by needle and syringe. And is there, is there any work going on, or do you know or what the possibilities are? <laughs> you thought of the same question. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, it, that, and we know that's a barrier to delivery of vaccines in many parts of the world. So I just wondered if you knew of uh, things that were ongoing to, that might uh, get over that barrier. Right. Well, RNA has also been given intravenously. And, that won't go. <laughs> and it can, you know, it can go into the liver or spleen and make a lot of antibodies, for instance. You can deliver antibody genes and make monoclonal antibodies. There are some efforts to give it mucosally or give it by aerosol and try to get past the mucociliary blanket in the airways and get it down into the lung and get, you know, so, uh, so resident, that works. T resident memory. I'm not uh, very confident that that's going to work in the near future. But uh, the other thing is maybe RNA doesn't need to solve all of our problems. And 
you know, RNA still is pretty expensive, and it may be that, uh, you know, <laughs> rapid response, it's a great thing for RNA, or maybe priming is a great thing for RNA, but in the long run, a protein, which is very, can be made very inexpensively, may be better for boosting, or maybe better for the, you know, the later time points, and maybe it takes longer, but maybe a live attenuated virus or a chimeric virus like Ruth makes for RSV uh, would be a better way of establishing mucosal immunity later on. But those things take longer to develop just because of the safety issues that you have to go through. And so mRNA may not be the best thing for coronavirus five years from now. It may be a chimeric virus sprayed in the nose and a, a parainfluenza virus expressing the spike protein or something like that, and then everybody else gets boosted with the protein. And mRNA maybe would be used for children early on to get them primed. But I think mRNA is good for some things, but it's not like a panacea. And I think you have to use it uh, in certain ways. And right now, I don't see a good result mucosally. So multiple platforms are going to be <laughs> important long term. I think multiple platforms, not just for uh, expense, but for utility or getting the right location of the immune response. Yeah. Go ahead. You were right. <laughs> uh, hi, um, I'm Noreen Hines. I'm at the School of Medicine and here also at the School of Public Health. And my question in keeping with this, the trajectory along the entire development pathway is not just the development, but the delivery as well as uh, Diane brought up. Um, how do we um, not just get to a better delivery mechanism, that is a patch technology, which some places are working on, but how do we make them also better, more temperature stable so that the cold chain, which is so important in so many LMICs, I'm not saying that, that it should be stable at equatorial temperatures, but certainly better than we're doing now. And certainly we saw it as an issue with the mRNA vaccines. So um, do you anticipate that we'll be able to overcome that? Right. So um, you noticed at the beginning, uh, Pfizer BioNTech had to store at minus 80 and Moderna could do minus 30. And that, that's just because you can only use what you've proven. By the, because of the regulatory process. And so Pfizer BioNTech hadn't put as much effort into storage conditions as Moderna had. They'd been working on this uh, more. And so they had gotten up to 30. Well, eventually this is going to be lyophilized and stored at room temperature and maybe even put on a microneedle. Yeah. And, uh, like, and maybe that was part of Diane's question. but. You know, I think a lyophilized mRNA lipid nanoparticle on a microneedle uh, patch is, you know, maybe where this is going to be 10 years from now. And, and I think those kind of things can be overcome because those are engineering problems. They basically are just, it's engineering and that can be solved. When, when you turn it into an engineering problem, it can usually be solved. Um, I'm Amanda Devis. I'm with the Department of International Health, and I'm working on this year prevalence study at the hospital. So you mentioned just now boosting. And so while it's somewhat controversial with both needing to achieve certain vaccine rates and equity globally, what do you think from the vaccinology perspective, though, with the idea that we don't have a perfect gold standard to understand um, antibody or correlative protection, and what is the need for it, given the messaging right now being somewhat confusing in the U.S.? So the correlative immunity is complicated because it's very clear that more antibody is better. The more antibody you have, the less chance you have of getting infected and the less chance you have of getting disease. But you can't uh, define the lower limit of that in an efficacy trial. The studies that have been done so far have not been able to define a lower limit of antibody that you need because it goes down so low that you can't really discern it. And I think part of that is because of what we were talking about earlier, that uh, anamnestic responses in this disease are probably very effective because uh, you get infected and that boosts itself in time to prevent lower airway disease. 
So even without any antibody present, a lot of people are protected with the current level of immunity, at least by the mRNA vaccines. And so we don't really have a lower level antibody threshold that we say this is it. And it's going to be hard to translate the correlate of immunity from an mRNA that's also inducing CD8 T cells to a protein-based approach that's only making antibodies and doesn't really have that CD8 component. And until we really see the outcome of like the Novavax program that had a very high efficacy in the efficacy trial, until we see that played out over time, we, may, we won't or whether we can see a difference between the lower and upper airway protection uh, to understand what the CD8 component may have contributed to that overall efficacy. I think we'll have opportunities to learn from these trials uh, in that way, but knowing exactly the correlate or translating the correlate from one modality to another is going to be difficult. And so knowing... Um, who to boost in a more precise way is going to be difficult. And we talked about this earlier too, but um, you know, boosting 100 million Americans um, with a late dose, um, you know, that is in some ways a moral dilemma for equity across the whole globe when. Seven billion people need to be immunized. But in another way of thinking, it kind of comes out of a different pot. These are vaccines that would never make it into a developing country setting. And 100 million doses is not really a very big jump on seven billion needed doses. And, and some of the mRNA vaccines can't be taken at this point in time, at least, to certain places and be distributed effectively. So, and also the disease has been worse in the U.S. than in many places, even though we may not have the right data. It may be worse than we think in some places. And in South Africa, for instance, I think the excess mortality is about three times higher than the COVID-related mortality, which means about only a third of the cases are being captured. But uh, so there is a moral dilemma with the boosting, but I think that's a problem that's going to have to be solved in peacetime, not during the crisis. And that's, that's what we really need to work on before the next pandemic starts, I think. Well, um, we could keep going and keep going, but I think our, our time here is up. I really wanted to thank you so much, Barney, for, um, for sharing your time with us. I know it's, despite your, despite your retirement, it's, uh, there's not a lot of time. And I also wanted to thank Dean McKenzie um, for, uh, for the Dean's Medal um, and for all of you for participating here today in person and for the many people who I think are, are listening in or who will hear the recording. So thank you all very much for, for being here. Mm -hmm.